Today we have Jason Peterson, who I actually uh, got to know because I had some samples I didn't know what to do with. Uh, and so I actually ended up uh, getting connected to Jason and found out all the fun things he does. So he's going to be talking about their public health laboratory. So it's really quite fascinating, uh, the things that they're doing in our state that really none of us know about. Um, so coming up, actually, next week, we have uh, the University of Minnesota Veterinary Program will be presenting on what the, the veterinary world is doing, especially with pain management and, you know, animals having their pain meds and what that looks like when it comes to their human owners. So and then Kurt will give his some time after that, I'm assuming. Yeah, I'm thinking it'll probably be the next week, although we have another person that potentially may drop in there. We have a lot of talks coming up, but it, some of them aren't uh, till September and October. So we'll fill in some of these others. Um, so if you could, please turn your video on so Jason can talk to a face. Again, we just kind of went over the question. So feel free to chat it in or interrupt. That's cool too. Otherwise, we'll kind of help facilitate that at the very end. After this is done, you will get an email from Katie. If you want your CME credits, please fill that thing out before Friday. All right. Again, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out. There's phone numbers there. There's cell phone numbers there. Um, we get calls all the time on, on patient issues, and we're always happy to always happy to help you out. So give us a ring. And the Center for Opioid Resources and Education, the core site. Please check that out. You can get the recordings of these as well as any type of policies, protocols. Basically, the manual is now virtual. So with that, Jason, thank you again for joining us. You can share your own slides. If you want to give a little bit more of an introduction as to what you actually do, that would be fantastic. Oh, yeah, I totally will. Um, give me a second while I share my screen. Let me, let me get the slideshow going first. Try that and then be able to see my screen right now. I know it's not kind of in slideshow mode. Yep. Now, is it bigger now? Yep. Perfect. Um, so thanks for having me. First off, I, I always appreciate sharing what services we offer here at the Public Health Lab, because as Kurt kind of mentioned, a lot of times people don't necessarily know what we do. Um, and it's a valuable resource that the more that um, different clinicians and, and groups and organizations know about, the better we're able to provide this service to you. So my talk today, like you said, it does seem a little daunting, um, chemical threats and biosurveillance. Uh, first off, my group, the unit that I supervise is kind of undergoing a name change. So I'm testing out the new moniker today. So you're welcome for it to be my beta testers. Uh, we are the chemical threats and biomonitoring unit. I'll cover a lot of what we do um, in terms of that because it does kind of encompass a lot of work. So agenda-wise, for the public health lab, you know, I'll give a, a brief overview of how we're organized because we do encompass a lot of stuff. Um, I'm going to cover the laboratory response network um, as it does pertain to the work we do. You'll get a little bit better idea of where we're coming from, um, how we handle some and participate in some emergency response sample analysis, and then more specifically to talk about two really interesting programs and projects that we operate with and are a part of, one being the Minnesota Drug Overdose and Substance Use Surveillance Activity, or as we'll call it, MINDOSA, and the Minnesota Timely Emerging Substance Testing, or MINTEST. Everything in state government, right, has got to have a fun moniker and acronym, so those are kind of the two we've created for that. And, and through those projects is how kind of think Kurt was referred to me to provide some testing assistance. So kind of right off the bat, the public health lab is an all hazards facility for the state. What that really means is that we have groups within the facility capable of doing chemical testing analysis, biological testing analysis, and radiological testing analysis. Um, my group, based off of you know our name, is, is performs the chemical testing for a variety of either biomonitoring studies or biosurveillance studies for, you know, say 
PFAS in the East Metro or pesticides up in the kind of farm fields or outstate portion of it. Um, so we have a lot of projects revolving around different chemicals. And then I'll talk pretty soon about what the laboratory response network is. And that's really where some of the chemical threat WMD style exposures are what we have the capabilities to test for. But as a whole, the public health lab really is comprised of multiple different groups and units. Um, being able to do the newborn screening testing, all of the, those blood spot tests for that come through our facility. We have a whole group designated for that six days a week. Um, hospitals routinely connect with our biological testing agency or group. Um, they're doing infectious disease testing. You know, during COVID, we were heavily involved in sequencing COVID to make sure we're understanding what iteration of it is prevalent and tracking its kind of growth in different avenues and, and exposures. And then the main portion of the floor that I actually work on is the environmental laboratory and their mission is to do all of the water testing through the state for the municipalities that have city water. Uh, there's the Safe Drinking Water Act that are set up by the EPA and we gotta make sure that the water people are consuming is underneath design thresholds. So as you can see, we're, we're very, you know, in this one building, we contain a lot of different avenues, um, which plays into a good role for terms of being all hazards, because then we can respond and provide information on a variety of different events. And that's kind of the main goal of what we're doing. So the Laboratory Response Network, I imagine most people probably haven't heard of it. If you have, that's fantastic. Um, the mission of the LRN, is how we abbreviate it for short, is to provide a local and national asset for laboratory response that can you know, provide data on a wide range of either chemical or biological emergencies or threats. It really grew out of a need to analyze unknown substances or exposures from that 2000 anthrax attacks where you know, one individual was mailing a bunch of white, white powders to different politicians throughout the country. At that time, you know, 23 years ago, we didn't really have a good way to rapidly understand the scope of what we were dealing with. And through a combination of different agencies, kind of gave birth to the LRN. Um, and it comes in a couple different forms. There is one for chemical threats, which my group participates in. And there's one for biological threats, uh, which our infectious disease group participates in. You know, I mentioned earlier, there's a radiological component. Uh, that hasn't been fully funded through LRN, but here at the health lab, we do radiological screening because of the two nuclear power plants that we have in the state. So we are part of a radiological emergency preparedness plan because of those two power plants. Um, it, it allows us instrumentation and staff to be dedicated to tracking any potential exposures for like a radiological release from one of those plants. The beauty of the LRN really though, is that it becomes a network of laboratories um, across the country who all use the same validated methods. So say there is a large scale chemical threat attack or exposure at maybe a stadium or, or a festival or something, um, you know, one lab, would be immediately overwhelmed if we're given, you know, say 5,000 clinical samples to test at one time. But because of how the LRN network is set up, we can push out some of those samples to other labs who have the same technology um, and they can provide the same services. And then we can get you results faster so that we know really the population level exposure, uh, it, which then becomes easier to understand the scope of what we're dealing with and how we can then mitigate it going forward. So it, it, it becomes a very valuable tool. The way the LRN is broken apart in for chemical threats specifically on this regard is it's broken into three levels. In Minnesota, as you can see by the map here, we are what's designated as a level one state. Uh, there's 10 level one facilities across the country. They are the most, um, funded and they have the most capabilities. So we have more staff, we have more instrumentation, and we're able to handle a heavier burden should a large scale event happen. Now, thankfully, large scale events are not routine. So we're able to use then those resources to support the state um, in a different way, which 
has kind of helped us adapt it to some of our other projects, like the Mendoza and Mintes project that I'll talk about as we move a little forward. But the resources that we're able that we get from LRN, the knowledge base that we get from detecting, you know, multiple different chemical threat agents allows us to bridge into different avenues and provide services in an immediate kind of emergency response. When you step down from level one facilities, like we are in Minnesota, uh, to level two facilities, they're still testing for a variety of the same substances, but on a different scale, um, just because they don't have the same number of staff or instrumentation. And so their requirements are a little less. They don't have to test for every substance that might be considered like a core method. They'll test for a certain number of them. And then as you step down further to the level three labs, there's not many level three only labs, uh, but their purpose is essentially to help coordinate samples transferring. You know, if something happens in say Oregon, they're not gonna have the capabilities to test for it, but they're going to work with that facility to collect samples, maybe ship them to their health lab and then disperse them out to another LRN lab. Each state has that capability because as you go up, you know, we also have level three capabilities. We have a, a chemical threat coordinator that does the same work as the chemical threat coordinator in Oregon. Um, but typically what they're doing is trying to get samples to our facility so that we can test them in-house versus shipping them out somewhere else unless we need to. When we look at uh, the bioterrorism group or bio threat setup, it's very similar for LRMB. Um, they have more labs, in there, but they're structured a little differently. Um, I forgot to mention on the our chemical threat LRNC side, the top facility is really CDC. They have the most capabilities, and then you step down to the level one lab. So we're still coordinated through them. We work closely with them if there's an event going on. Um, but sometimes we have to contact them to request assistance. LRNB is the same way. Um, the big distinguishing piece of it is CDC for some of the more high consequence select agents have to get sent off to CDC for confirmation. And so their labs, instead of one, two, three designation, they kind of have confirmatory or um, I forget what the other term is right now. More of like a response lab or, or kind of a, they can confirm stuff, but not everything. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name. But either way, they operate in a similar capacity. Some of them have more or less capabilities depending on kind of where they are on that spectrum. Here in Minnesota, we are another one of those. It's a reference lab thing. There we go. Um, we're a reference lab. Uh, we're one of the more high throughput reference labs based off of the testing that we have kind of through state funding, but also through the LRN funding. So we tend to get tapped into doing a little more rule in or rule out at different hospitals. I know LRNB, they have probably a better relationship with uh, clinics and hospitals just because you sometimes have those isolates that need to be sent to us um, for rule outs or rule ends of, of different exposures. So that's like in essence the LRN in general um, and now I'm going to kind of talk a little more specifically just in terms of the chemical threat aspect of it uh, just because that's what my group is geared towards. So as a level one response lab we are provided and lucky enough to have multiple capabilities. The majority of our testing done in-house is on liquid chromatography, triple quad mass specs. So very sensitive equipment, allows us to detect very low levels um, of targeted agents. We've also been adding high resolution mass spectrometry and, and that's probably come up. You may have kind of started to hear about it more and more because it's, it's a very valuable tool in terms of analytical testing. It takes into account aspects of our targeted approach with the liquid chromatography mass spectrometers, but then also adds in some additional ability to separate out similar compounds. And, and that can become important when you think in terms of drugs, because there are isomers that are very similar. Um, they might come off at, on our columns together and, and we can't fully resolve them, but through high resolution, mass spec, we start to be able to collect some accurate mass information on them and start to be able to distinguish them. So we really can give a little bit better scope of what's going on and what the exposure is. For our LRN methods though, um, we have nerve agents. Now nerve agents, I know it can be in general broad. 
for LRN capabilities, nerve agents really refer to the weapons of mass destruction style nerve agents. So say there's a sarin gas exposure, um, that type of nerve agent exposure, we would be involved in testing samples for it to confirm you know, what iteration of it as there are you know, a multiple different types, not just sarin, it's just an example. Same with nitrogen mustards, um, cyanide exposures, tetramines, toxic metals, or you know, leucite. These are all based off of you know, historically used and dangerous um, WMD style agents. Again, these exposures are very rare, but one of the ones that I'll, I will talk about and highlight is ricinine as you know, made popular more recently through the Breaking Bad series. People are able to legally own castor beans, but they can also take that and produce ricin from them um, and then use that in various ways. And I'll show you guys an example of how the utility of the LRN really played out in real time here in the state and what makes it more valuable in that regard. But kind of, as I mentioned before, because we don't routinely have to respond to like a nerve agent attack or a nitrogen sulfur mustard attack, um, we have been able to use this technology to do drugs of abuse testing, which is how we are able to provide services through Mendoza. So a real world um, incident kind of played out here four years ago um, involving ricin. So ricin, we know that it's a toxic byproduct of the production of you know, castor oil from the castor bean. You can buy the plant, um, castor beans aren't illegal, castor plants, you know, they're fully legitimate to own. They're actually very pretty with their big leaves. Um, but when you refine out the ricin toxin from them, you know, it, it's very stable, very deadly, can be, in a powder form, you can press it into a pellet. It can be put into water or a weak acid and kind of aerosolized as a mist, which then kind of ratchets it up in terms of threat levels, right? Because you could really expose a lot of people in a short amount of time based off of how you decide to manufacture it and disperse it. So back in 2019, kind of in the springtime, um, we had this incident start to play out late in May 6th where an individual, um, this, all, this some of this information we got after the fact, so we didn't know it going in, but an individual essentially purchased a, you know, castor beans, we tried to refine them, and intentionally ingested these capsules that they made um, in, for the effort of self-harm. When we first got notified, we didn't know that it was only for self-harm. Um, you have to kind of play these incidents out in terms of what is the wider ranging scope or danger to the public. Uh, we don't know if this was a part of a larger incident that you know more people would have been sick or if it's one individual. But ultimately they, they consumed um, these capsules late on in the evening on May 6th, went to bed, woke up eight, 10 hours or so later um, and reported to the hospital. This was taking place at a local university and they were reported to the hospital on site with like GI illness, vomiting, fatigue, lethargy, which when you look back at it, is you know, good indicators of a ricin exposure, but there's also indicators of potentially other exposures too. You wouldn't immediately go to ricin if somebody presented with this type of symptomology. Um, but in terms of treating the patient, there the hospital's working with them, trying to kind of get them to stabilize. And a conversation took place where the individual admitted to consuming ricin toxin. Um, through trainings like this, we want to kind of raise the, the awareness that if this happens to you, it should red flag, right? It should be, we need to call the poison center. We need to get a hold of MDH. We have something larger going on and potentially more dangerous going on than, you know, the immediate care of the individual. Something else is possibly at play. Um, and we also need to confirm this exposure to rice and, and we're the facility to do so. But through some series of events that didn't immediately red flag at this facility, which since then we've been able to bridge that gap and, and kind of have a better relationship with them. Um, but we got notified as a lab. You know, they, the individual eight to 10 hours are probably in the morning. We didn't get notified until about 5.30 that evening that there was a potential rice and exposure event playing out on a university campus in the state. So that ramps us up. Right. As part of the LRN, we are set to respond to wide scale emergencies like this. Um, so we are immediately are on phone calls with emergency management, hazmat team, um, law enforcement, and 
the hospital and the hospital's um, lab staff so that we can work on getting multiple pieces of information and samples sent over to our facility for analysis. In this case, um, our method is designed for detection of ricinine, which is a co-occurring extract in urine. So we're working with the hospital to try to get urine samples from the time the individual was admitted to the hospital and then in like four hour increments so that we can help track to make sure you know, the treatment is progressing or, or hopefully working the way it was intended to work for, you know, to try to get them stable and healthy again. And in the meantime, we're also trying to get the pills that they say they manufactured because we want to know were they actually in pills or is this in a raw powder form? How much of it is exposed outside of their apartment? Um, so that's where the, the law enforcement and the hazmat teams come in play because we're able to coordinate with them. Uh, Time-wise, this, you know, fast forward a couple hours, we're able to get the pills from the individual's apartment to our facility at roughly eight o'clock in the evening. Uh, we had already been calling staff back in, kind of letting them know what's going on so that they can perform this analysis. Pills immediately went upstairs to our bioterrorism unit um, and they were performing PCR to confirm ricin. That test somewhere is in usually in between like the three to four hour time frame. Um, and then about an hour or so after the pills arrived, you know, we were able to get a urine sample or multiple urine samples from the individual. And we started running those on our methods here to confirm the ricinine exposure. So when you have, you know, the physical product plus the clinical sample, then you get that circular bit of knowledge and you know kind of full scope of the exposure. It was, we have proof here, you know, ricin was found in the pills, ricinine was found in their urine. Yes, this is their exposure event. And now we know fully what you know this person encountered, and now we have to figure out the rest of is anybody else at danger. It took us you know roughly two hours from the time we got that urine specimen to when we were confirming um, the presence of ricinine, and then the pills themselves we were able to confirm those out at about midnight. So within you know four hours of immediately of getting pills. And then within a couple hours of getting the urine samples, we're able to provide actionable data to all the players in this game and then in this response, which if you think about it, you know, especially for after hours, it's very challenging to get, you know, clinical samples transferred from hospitals to an offsite place, not during regular working hours. Um, so being able to get that done and get results back out to people who need to know in that amount of time frame is, is pretty good. Almost, it's as close to real time as you can get with this type of testing for offsite analysis. And then over the course of that time, um, we requested, you know, continued to request urine samples from the individual so that we could chart how well they responded to treatment. And as you can see in their urine, um, the very first peak we have here on May 7th at about you know, noon, that's pretty much at the top end of our calibration curve. So the exposure in urine was exceptionally high when we tested that first sample. But then through the course of treatment, we can see it starting to nicely eliminate. Um, so the hospital provided really good care. You can see that it really does hang out in their system for a, quite a long time as the body's trying to process it and eliminate it. And then ultimately four days later, they refuse to get consent to continue to consent to provide us with urine samples, which is totally understandable. Um, but it did provide us with a really nice data set to show, you know, one, the utility of our testing and also that the treatment provided to them was the proper course and ultimately helped them survive and then continue to get further treatment, hopefully for um, some of their other troubles that resulted in them attempting to do this self-harm. So that's a really good example of what we can do with our LRN capabilities. We have some of this reach back. We have the ability to respond to incidences in real time and provide some additional data from an analytical standpoint. Because of that, some of the other interesting things we're able to do is not just test those clinical exposures. Um, like I said, the LRN really grew out of a white powder unknown threat. So as an all hazards facility, we have built in procedures and protocols for how to handle those incidences when they happen, because they still happen. Um, people become upset. They take unknown white powders, throw them into a letter um, with some type of threat attached to it, and they will mail it to courthouses or sheriff's offices or politicians or, or whoever um, in an attempt to scare them. And 
the immediate concern with all of that is have an uh, unfortunate individual who is usually not the target. They may be opening that letter first to make sure it's getting to the right person, and now they are exposed to an unknown substance. And we want to make sure that they know what that exposure was. So because of this, we work kind of in that same manner as that ricin incident um, to get those substances to our facility. And they can be, really be anything um, that potentially poses public health threat. In this instance, you know, this would be like a white powder, but they can also be in contaminated chicken from a you know, disgruntled employee from a local private corporation where they were mad about something, grabbed an unknown, you know, black substance and threw it onto a bunch of products in hopes to make the company look bad by multiple people getting sick. These came to our facility for analysis and we were able to provide them with, with some characterization of what was going on. They can also be pills. These were the pills um, that we were able to get from the ricin incident. Uh, we're able to, as you can see, they're kind of clumpy, so they weren't fully refined for full toxicity, which is good. Um, help that individual live and help you know the hospital provide care to make sure that was if it had been more of a refined product their concentration you know may have very much led to a different outcome for them but we're able to get substances like this and begin to test them and characterize what is that substance what is the unknown um, we have a really good and you'll see as we get into mendoza the panel we have for drugs is, is really large um, and we have very specific protocols in place for how we can confirm this type of unknown samples and then you get other um, unknown powders. Not every powder is white, even though they may start out white in its pure form, it's definitely mixed with something else or the refinement process lends it to be a different color, such as black here. Um, this one was involved in a big kind of narrative of drugs and usages and, and there were some threats associated to it and they had you know taped on here that they claimed it to be opium. Um, so we were able to try to pull off this substance and identify it for them to really characterize the threat because people did open this and they they were exposed. The kind of main takeaways from those first two LRN and the emergency unknowns is that there are people here at the health lab, uh, my group specifically, who are designed to respond to emergency response situations. Um, we have individuals that are on call 24-7. Our lab is not staffed 24-7, but there are reach back capabilities should something like this kind of pop up and you need a consultation. A lot of times what happens is an event you know, happens you know, always at five o'clock on a Friday. We need to start to gather information, um, see who's exposed, what is the extent of it, and then we really have a conversation of, is this more of an emergency where we need to call staff back in after hours, or is the nature of the threat one that can kind of be delayed until the next working day or whatever. Um, but there is that conversation that play out and we have staff here available to help on that for chemical threats, biological threats, radiological threats. Um, there's epidemiologists that are on call 24 seven. Should there be, you know, like foodborne illnesses or infectious disease illnesses and things like that, that you need just some information on to, you know, understand maybe a, a course of action you want to take. So now we'll transition, unless anybody's got kind of questions on the front end stuff there. Um, I'm going to move into maybe more specific talk on our two projects, the Mendoza project and the Mintest project. But if somebody's got a question, feel free to interrupt or fire away or, or we'll do it at the end. I do have Go a ahead. question. Um, in yeah. terms of things like this, Ryson, or in any other type of, I don't know, Minnesota specifically, but how involved do you then get legally? you know, in terms of are there charges associated and, and what kind of oversight do you then have? Because I'm assuming, you know, this could be a pretty significant thing if, you know, people really did get hurt, you know, widespread. Yes. So from our standpoint, um, we work part of one some of the agencies we work with because we do work with local, state and federal partners. Uh, we have a really strong working relationship with our weapons of mass destruction coordinator through the FBI. And the stance that we've always been kind of working with them with is the testing for public health safety trumps a public safety or law enforcement investigation. So in, in case of the, the Ricin one, 
we were testing the sample not for legal charges. Um, had they wanted to go a forensic route and they did ultimately take those pills later um, to bring them to their facility for forensic analysis, you know, we're, we're really testing them in an immediate, here is the threat that we're associating with right now. We need to understand what we're responding to um, because the safety of the general public is going to trump the potential legal aspect that they have to go through later. So we're not supporting the legal side, we're really supporting the, what do we need to do to mitigate this threat to the general public? Um, and the FBI has been really good with that because they totally understand that, it, you know, we'll use the rights of one in this case, by the time they're able to talk to the individual and they're going down their investigation, they're seeing that the attempts were not to harm multiple others. It was only an attempt to self harm on their self. So the potential threat to them, you know, exposing different people and making them sick is drastically lower, which means the legal side of it doesn't have to be as complex or complicated. But it is kind of in that toad line, right? There is a Bureau of Criminal right. Apprehension. Um, I actually used to be a forensic scientist, so <laughs> I know kind of how their mission is mm -hmm. and, and how our mission is different. Their mission is really science applied to statute, so to law, right? So if they're looking for certain substances um, from like a driving involved intoxication case, it's really being applied to what is the statutory level that people can legally have in their system. Versus Do you, what we're doing mm -hmm. is like a wide ranging surveillance of what's in their system as a whole. So we know how to hopefully prevent some of the bad outcomes. Do you do you typically or do you ever go like on site rather than things getting brought to the lab? You know, whether it's an acute, you know, anthrax type situation or um, go to like the specific hospital to do testing with them, you know, because it you know, faster if going to the chemical than waiting for it to get to the lab? Typically, no. Um, we do work closely with hazmat teams so that if they're responding on site, we will provide them guidance on here's the best way to package this so you can get it to us quickly. Um, since we're working with extremely sensitive mass spectrometers, we, those aren't really portable. Um, so getting the substance to us is really our preferred way. There has been, there have been times, I will say that uh, a couple hospitals had some unknown pills and it was challenging to try to get them to us. So instead I drove to the hospitals and picked them up and brought them back to our facility. So it's kind of an in-between deal. Um, there are, there are staff that are trained in hazardous material response through like Hazwopper. So we do have capabilities to respond to different things. But generally, we want the hazmat teams to go out there because they have more tools to stay safe while they're helping mitigate that threat on scene. We just kind of want to stay out of the way and play our role. Hmm. That kind of answer which question was? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Do you guys do you guys interact with the fifty fifth CST a lot? I'm guessing we do. Um, we do. Yes. So there is a. Uh, Kind of a response group that we have in the state. Uh, we refer to ourselves as MJET. Uh, it kind of started out as a jurisdictional exercise team, but has really grown into a multi-jurisdiction response group where um, Department of Health, the radiological response group here at the Department of Health, our epidemiologists, the FBI, the state fire marshal, um, hazmat team, and the 55th CST are all players in events like this Rice and One, are potential players in events like the Rice and One. So we all meet monthly um, to review responses that we may have been a part of or potential incidences that come up. And so we work closely with them for what we need as a lab versus what they need for mitigating the threat in the field. And if the if the surf was ever called up, you would feed back the info that you have about the agents back to them. Yeah. So if, if we're responding to an event in tandem, uh, we routinely reach back to each other. So if they're downrange and trying to characterize, again, we'll use the right one. If they're inside this apartment, um, we might be doing a live video feed of what they're seeing, so that we can provide them 
with maybe information on our end from, from the um, analysis side of here's what we see. Uh, if you, you know, grab that powder or this and we'll test it. Um, sometimes that's not always possible, obviously, but other times it might be they go down range, take pictures, and then we have a meeting and upload them and bring them back to us. And then as we're doing our testing, we're letting them know findings so that they can respond, you know, in real time, depending on, you know, the lag of getting samples to us from their site. And they also have a mobile lab. Um, the new version, though, is just very big, so I know it's hard for them to roll it out and get it operational. So sometimes they find it's easier to just get samples down to us versus rolling out their mobile lab to the site. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, so now I'm gonna, like I said, we're gonna change gears just a bit. Um, so Mendoza is a project that spawned one using technology from LRN and the, the staff knowledge that we have, but really it responded, it kind of grew out of two events that happened in, I think it was the summer of 2017. Uh, there was a multiple overdose event downtown St. Paul, kind of around the Dorothy Day shelter, where I think it was 30 or so individuals, could be more, but they were having a very adverse reaction to some substance. And multiple people over the course of hours were having a very similar response. So initially, we hear, we hear about this, and we don't know what it is kind of falls into our LRN testing. Um, the more information we get, and it sounded like it was going to be a, a synthetic cannabinoid exposure, um, which we at the time did not have a way to test for. And then a week or so later, there was a similar event that happened in downtown Minneapolis where same kind of symptomology was presenting itself with multiple people kind of overdosing over the course of a, you know, a fairly short time frame within you know, some type of hours. And in discussions, you know, we worked with, through our LRN capabilities, you know, we worked to get samples from some of those individuals as they were treated at hospitals and send them off to a different lab to really identify the synthetic cannabinoid ultimately is what it was that they were exposed to. But at the same time, we started having internal conversations of, we really should be able to detect this here so that there isn't a delay. Like if you have 30 people presenting or down around one site with similar symptoms, that's an indication of some high level chemical threat exposure. We as the health department and the LRN here in Minnesota feel it's our duty to be able to help try to identify that. And so that kind of spawned Mendoza itself. So in essence, Mendoza was created to understand substance misuse and drug overdose patterns in real time. Those incidents really highlighted that drug usage comes in many forms, um, having come from the the crime lab and the forensic agency, I kind of already had that thought in mind. Um, but really the difference is, is the individuals you're testing samples for, you know, in the toxicology section at the crime lab are mostly driving involved interactions. So there are multiple people that are on not just alcohol for DUIs, but they're also DUIDs, so, so drug involved ones. And most of the time they're on, you know, a couple different substances. So we, we kind of wanted to know, you know, instead of waiting sometimes up to a year for forensic data to potentially be available, and it's not always available for the general public, we want to understand more in real time what these substances are, especially if they're involved in clusters. Um, we want to know if they're changing. Uh, part of Mendoza involves site reports from emergency departments where we can look at symptomology from the individuals, um, kind of what you clinicians observe in their you know, presentation or maybe even what they say they consumed as you talk to them later, and then tie it back to toxicology data. So medical examiners do a really good job with death data. It's a lot more comprehensive. Um, you can get the forensic data sometimes for, it's a, probably not the best term, but realistically, if they're driving a car and there's a police interaction, they are somewhat of a functional um, user. They're not really pushed into that overdose state. But what really we're missing is this non-overdose or this non-fatal overdose category. And that's kind of where we felt with Mendoza, we could play our role. We could you know, identify large groups of people coming in, take a subset of their um, clinical samples, blood, urine, plasma, and then start to identify you know, patterns in that usage. And then that can help 
you know, provide that data back, inform clinicians, community partners, and really the public about substance use trends in our state, and then help guide some of these prevention efforts. From the lab side, uh, slides are a little bit outdated because we've expanded our panel. But right now we use um, liquid chromatography, high resolution mass spec, and we're over, I believe, 1,100 different substances, and that includes illicit substances, um, therapeutics, kind of traditional drugs, um, cutting agents, and then uh, metabolites as well. So we have a really extensive list of substances that we can help provide and characterize exposures to. And the way that we have it set up currently is that we're trying to find or look at those ones that are more severe or unusual. Um, that definition may change a bit as new funding becomes available. We might try to open it up a little more to try to not just characterize the unusual exposures, which might be an indication of a new substance emerging in the area or potentially a more concentrated substance. Uh, we might try to open it up a little bit more just so we can even get a, a scope of what's a typical exposure look like. Um, do we really understand a normal exposure we're treating and the substances involved in that? One of the very interesting things that I have kind of found with Mendoza is when we look at the medical data record extraction and compare it to the toxicology data that we provide at the health lab, you see a big difference in the substances that were suspected to have been consumed or exposed to versus the substances that are actually detected. So in the samples that we pulled for this one, and I forget what the, the numbers were, um, but 46, so less than half of them, were suspected to contain an amphetamine, typically methamphetamine. But then almost 70% actually contained methamphetamine when we ran the sample, or amphetamines in general. Um, and you can see that kind of plays out the same way across these broad categories, with the one exception of heroin. And I think you know, the best way to think about that one is Heroin itself, we don't detect that often, and it could be for a couple different reasons why we don't detect it. But I think in reality, heroin now is much less prevalent and has been fully replaced by fentanyl um, and fentanyl analogs. So when it's suspected or when an individual says they took heroin, the reality is they probably took a fentanyl combination substance, which leads to why that one is suspected more than it's detected. It also could be that heroin is fairly fast acting, and whenever the sample gets clinical sample gets pulled to when we're able to test it. And there just might have been too long of a delay between that time frame, um, where it, it could be low, could be below our detectable limit. But it is an interesting find and it really shows that clinicians are somewhat working off of an incomplete picture for you know providing the best treatment because maybe you're suspecting an opioid, um, they partially respond to naloxone and they, wake up in a very agitated state, which could be an indication that there was also a stimulant on board that they didn't know they consumed or didn't inform you or you didn't even see signs of initially. Uh, so this becomes very important in terms of how do we provide the best care and how do we message this out to the general public to make sure choices of using illicit substances are done safely or more safe than currently happening. The other thing that we can do is because our panel is so extensive, we can start to track out as new iterations of fentanyl, analogs, synthetic benzodiazepines, adulterants, things like that. As they start to pop up in our patient population or our sample population, we can detect them over time and we can see spikes and valleys in them. So you get good graphs here. You know, the one drop all the way down to the baseline, that's kind of an artifact um, only because it was kind of during COVID, we didn't really not detect any fentanyl in quarter one. I think it was just how this data set was pulled. Um, but you start to see like, oh, at that point, we're seeing increases in parafluoro fentanyl or benzyl fentanyl kind of comes and goes or this methoxyacetyl fentanyl emerges in this patient population. And now you get a better scope of what's the full extent of exposure. And it's not just to one substance, it's definitely to multiple substances. And that same thing can be said with xylazine. Um, xylazine is big in the news right now as a common adulterant in fentanyl substances. And we have had it in our panel for a long time, so we could see it starting to emerge in Minnesota. And then we can use that as messaging to kind of keep multiple people aware. And we're trying to do a better job of that and is 
keeping the public, keeping partners aware of substances as they emerge uh, within our, our sample set. And as we get more samples and from more populations of people, uh, we'll, we can try to be more comprehensive and hopefully show differences in different areas as well. Then kind of as a sister project to Mendoza, because the one limiting effect that you get or one limiting thing you get with toxicology data is really you don't know the time or the event of consumption, right? You don't know if that all those substances were at one point consumed in one substance or if they were done over the course of some time, right? And so we're not providing quantitative data. We're trying to give as much information as we can on the, the full scope of the exposures. But when you provide, you know, quantitative data, then it becomes, you have to limit your panel, it becomes everything as calibration curves and isotopic dilution and all these other um, steps we take to make sure that the value has more reliability. So to try to provide some of that extra information that we're missing with tox data, um, we've created this MinTest project, which is geared towards the testing of physical substances. Um, in addition, we do get kind of references to clinical substances from people, uh, just as like fire departments or law enforcement agencies respond to an individual that is experiencing an overdose. They get them transported to the hospital. Um, sometimes we're able to get clinical specimens from them as well and tie it. Hopefully, you know, the goal is to tie it the same way we did with the ricin incident, tie it to a product. And so then we can see like, what is the substance that officially kind of pushed them to the unfortunate overdose stage? Um, and, and try to get more information on that. So MinTest is really a partnership currently with local law enforcement agencies, and that's only done so because they routinely have substances that they have confiscated from you know, responding to an emergency situation, um, but are not part of a legal active criminal investigation. If it's part of a legal criminal investigation, the BCA handles that and we take no part in testing those. But they do have a lot of um, substances in their evidence vault that are not criminal in nature, but they are of interest to them. Maybe they're starting to pop up um, in their jurisdiction and they want to get more information on them. And we try to work with a couple of them to bring them to our facility, really with the ultimate goal of providing some insight to this drug environment and, and make sure that we're informing people as the drug environment's changing. A couple of the, the ways we've done this is through um, over the course of a year, we've, we've kind of loosely tracked these M30 pills in their composition. Uh, pretty much all the pills contain fentanyl or ANPP and acetaminophen. But over time, we started to see that, for instance, the pills here on the left that have a little more defined imprint, those ones also came, contained metamazole, which in conversation with other partners, started to show that maybe they were coming up from Mexico because it was, it was more of a common adulterant, we were told, from the southern borders. And then they started to change to these other ones that are faded. Um, they, those contained tramadol and parafluorofentanyl. And we started to kind of see a shift over time of not just containing fentanyl, but then also containing fentanyl plus an analog such as parafluorofentanyl and a cutting agent like tramadol. And that becomes important for partners to know because maybe it has to change some of the treatment they give for these individuals. And it definitely involves educating some of the harm reduction specialists to let people know that the substance they're used to taking is not going to be the same substance now. Um, and they need to be cautious with it so they don't have a negative adverse reaction. And then um, these dropper pill bottles I find very interesting. These were provided to us from a law enforcement agency. They found them a little odd. And when we tested them, I can understand why they thought, you know, I don't know the full scope of the, the incident that they were responding to, but after testing them, I could see why they may have been of interest to them. All of these dropper bottles contained synthetic benzodiazepines, but they didn't only contain one, they contained a variety of them. And our estimation is that these dropper bottles were used to, you know, we put on blotter paper or whatever media um, they were gonna use to sell and then just refilled with the next thing. And so after multiple fillings, um, possibly through also incomplete usage of the liquid inside, you have a very different mixture of what you're telling an individual that they're being exposed to versus what they're actually being exposed to. In addition, a couple of them had synthetic cannabinoids in there and methamphetamine. So you can see that it, it's very hazardous for the, the people that might be consuming these products to think that they're going to be getting something like a depressant style agent and then also 
instead getting a higher dosage of a stimulant that their body was not ready for or maybe not you know habituated to. And that, <clears throat> excuse me, could push them to need kind of clinical care. I found it very interesting because we, when we first looked at them, um, we thought, man, do we have contamination of everything? And then we started running them more individually and found that no, in fact, like each one of these themselves had multiple substances on board and different amounts. A couple, one of the South Metro PDs, they found these pills um, from an individual. They actually thought that they were MDMA because they kind of looked like they could potentially be used in, as like an ecstasy pill, even though they're not as finely pressed. Um, these ones were actually cocaine with a very small amount of methamphetamine inside of them. So it's, again, it's that same problem of you know, individuals might think that they're getting one thing, but in fact, they're getting something totally different. This is the case, you know, kind of related, but instead of more of that euphoric, almost hallucinogenic style stimulant like MDA, they're getting a very different one in cocaine um, and some methamphetamine. Same thing here with these pills that we tested. Um, these ones were found at a, a supermarket shelf, kind of, I think, in the cereal aisle. They were placed behind some, I think they were placed behind a cereal box, and they were really used in terms of, we think it's a drop point. Um, with the different colors and the different shapes, you know, the, the different colors themselves really indicate different batches of products. You know, pill presses are easy to, to swap out a dye and press a different shape into it, but the different colors really indicate different preparation batches. Um, so being all together, uh, the assumption was that they were going to be all the same, but we didn't really know. Um, so we tested a bunch of the different colors and shapes, and everything was positive for methamphetamine. And the suspicion, uh, again, on the front end was, was these were going to be MDMA or ecstasy. Um, so again, the officers that were responding, they were very new to them. They didn't really know what they were dealing with, and we were able to try to provide some of that information on the front end so that if they encounter them later, they know, one, what they're getting into helps keep them safe, but also kind of helps them address some of the more public health and safety concerns around them um, to educate you know, potential people using it or being exposed to it. So that kind of brings me to the end of like a rough overview of services we offer here at the health lab. Um, so hopefully you're able to, you know, interested in learning more or maybe open your kind of thought process on some of the analytical support THL can provide either through our laboratory response network or one of the things we're trying to do with new funding is actually expand Mendoza. Mendoza right now is at a hospital system here in the metro area and then one up in the Duluth area and we want to get out to other hospital regions so that we can provide data statewide and region specific and hopefully you know get it so that if, if there are different drug patterns in different regions um, we can be better with our messaging for prevention um, so hopefully you know maybe this will be something that you want to have further discussions about is like how can we as a hospital participate in mendoza or min tests as well like, i know hospitals do get substances from individuals when they treat them i imagine you struggle the same way as others with how do we dispose of them and what should we do with them um, or maybe there are ones that are of interest and you want to know what they are. And we could potentially be an avenue to assist you with that um, analysis. So that's really all I got for my presentation. I, I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. Go ahead, Heather. All right. <laughs> with So one thing when we first started seeing fentanyl, for instance, you know, greater Minnesota started to see fentanyl almost before the Twin Cities did. Do you guys track that like data and, you know, where you're starting to see these unknown substances to try to alert other places? And then second part of that question is, you know, combining with the other states in the country to see trends in where different states are seeing different things and then like how that's all used. Sorry, that was a lot so in that, one question. No, no, that's, that's a great question because that is um, one thing that we want to improve on. So since you know, a project like Mendoza is only in the Duluth area and their hospital system and then down here in the metro area, we can't fully track who is being exposed, what, where, and first, right? But as we are able to onboard you know, some of the other eight regions, hospital regions, we can start to get that information. And, you know, it, it's actually very interesting you brought that up because 
I feel like everything happened in 2019, but I might be skewed because of COVID, right? Everybody's got this like three year block of what, what in the world happened. Um, but does everybody remember when there was that um, super warfin put into like synthetic cannabinoids and that people were like heavily bleeding inside and they couldn't stop it? Mm-hmm. So that, so no, um, that was first identified in Wisconsin. And I feel it was like either 2019, 2020-ish. Um, and through some of the testing, we started to actually see how the substance moved because people were responding to hospitals um, and reporting cases to different health departments over time. And you started to see it kind of that product that we felt was contaminated with the super warfin um, shift along major corridors and interstate highways. And then, you know, same thing with the Evali incident in 2019 or the, the lung injury that popped up in 2019 from the the contaminated THC product. Um, we were heavily involved in that testing. And again, we could start to see as hospitals were reporting cases, they were starting to follow major corridors. In that case, it came up out of Chicago because that's where like some of the first individuals were that were mass producing those illicit THC cartridges with that diluent. Um, so you started to see it kind of bridge out of some central places. So yeah, that's a great thing that we want to do. Um, but we can't do it currently only because we don't have enough sites on board to kind of help build that data set. Alicia, it looks like you had a question. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think you kind of touched on this, uh, Jason, and so I apologize if I'm doubling back. But, um, you know, a couple of years ago when we were at the RX Summit, I remember there was a lot of conversation about marijuana potentially being laced with fentanyl but um i think that from a lot of the conversations or the presentations there there wasn't actually really much proof of that um from what they said is you know so far any ones that they've tested they haven't really actually come across that of course there's a lot of narratives and like speculation about it but not a whole lot of proof behind it so i'm curious like how much proof or have you now seen like unsuspecting marijuana being contaminated with fentanyl um and by uh, that i mean facility, like instances where it was not aware to the person buying it sure um i will say our facility is zero we've never detected it um in that regard caveat is we haven't tested a bunch of marijuana um, leaf-based product now the only incident that i'm aware of in the country where they were able to detect fentanyl with that was in marijuana leaf-based product um, was put there intentionally by the individuals that were consuming it. Um, that was in, that was one that initially kind of popped up some of the media notes of it, and now fentanyl is in marijuana. But the reality is, is, is those individuals that consumed it and had a, a very severe adverse reaction, from my understanding, was that they put it there themselves. But there has been no other documented case where it's you know been into, where it's been targeted to be put inside marijuana leaf. Uh, one of the things that we don't fully know, but I think some of the testing, like those dropper bottles are a good example. There are times where, and even those kind of weirdly colored, let me go back, like these pills here. Um, these pills were predominantly cocaine. We're not quantitating stuff, um, but we did find a little bit of methamphetamine in these pills. It was a very small peak. Um, but I think in our discussions and interpretation of that is, while cocaine was intended to be put in there, this site probably also pressed marijuana pills, or not marijuana pills, sorry, methamphetamine pills, um, or manufactured methamphetamine crystals. And there is a incidental contamination that is a possibility. Um, we just haven't seen it with marijuana where you're seeing a, a lot of fentanyl or other things in into it. Um, I will say from doing a lot of the Evoli testing and our Mendoza testing, the two populations of people um, and the drugs that were identified in their system were actually very different. Uh, it was really interesting, and I, I should have pulled a, put a slide in here for that, but you had predominantly THC users and not a lot of more of the heavier illicit substances in that Evoli population um, versus our Mendoza population, which really is a conglomerate of many different substances. I think Evoli, we probably averaged 
you know, like four different detections, maybe five different detections, and some of that was also um, metabolites. Whereas the Mendoza population, we're generally seeing eight to ten different substances on board. Um, so it's a very different usage pattern for these individuals. Hmm. You know, it's interesting that if you, um, you know, we've just seen so much fentanyl in the methamphetamine now. One of the issues really is that, and I've had many, many patients say this to me, is they say, no, it's it's just fentanyl or it's just Xanax. It, this is a friend of mine I'm buying it from, and I trust them more than I trust your tests. Um, and it's like, it's pretty funny that, that the reality is still pa these patients that we have are buying things and they they truly believe that these people dealing these know exactly what's in it, which clearly they don't, right? There's yes, and, and that's a very, uh, that's a good point. And that's one of the things that I, I'm hopeful that our data can show. You know, people are going to choose to use substances. I mean, that's been a thing forever, right? Um, the drug landscape today is so different than it was 20 years ago. Substances are definitely being um, cut or dispersed and contaminated with multiple different things to spread the supply out. So while they may trust their dealer, I think the reality that, that they need to understand is that that dealer got it from somebody else who got it from somebody else who got it from somebody else. And, and everybody trusts each other, except that you don't know what two or three iterations earlier did. So by the time a consumer is, is getting exposed to it, there's no quality control to that product. It was definitely illicitly manufactured. Um, and you're right, there is, uh, you know, we've detected fentanyl in methamphetamine. Um, I don't know if it's intentionally put in there or if it's in the case of like, you know, these cocaine pills where fentanyl was also pressed at that same facility, they're, they're not going to clean in between preps like we would here at the health lab. You know, so you're going to have co-occurrent detection or, or, you know, unintended exposures because of that. And then, you know, I, I should have put this on enough too, now that kind of, comes into my head and this picture maybe is a good picture for it too so if you see on the front end here there's this little half or not even half little sliver of a yellow pill uh, the concentration of cocaine in this yellow portion here is probably vastly different than if i took a similar slice of cocaine concentration in this like purpley blue pill i think that amount is going to be very different so when you look at those m30 pills and sometimes they cut them into quarters um, one quarter might have very little one quarter might have all of it. And so then even within that pill, you're getting a very different exposure platform or profile just by what you consumed. Mm. That has gotten us in the past where we're like, we got a pill, a, a powder, and we took a small fragment of it, tested it, and it came back as nothing. We're like, well, that's really weird. So then we grabbed a larger chunk of it. Um, and it helped kind of change how we process these samples. Uh, we start to take a larger represent, representative portion so that we make sure that we're identifying things because that initially taught us like, okay, these are not homogenous. <laughs> we don't know if we take, you know, cut this pill in half and we take just the left half that we're good. We got to like mix up the whole pill and then take a representative sample of it to try to identify stuff. So when it comes to identifying new things, how do you go about that? You know, especially like the synthetics when they might just change like one chain on this chemical structure. What does that process look like? Yeah, there's a couple of different ways we can do it. Um, and that's where the high resolution uh, mass spec technology that we've implemented has been or will be very valuable. Um, this is something that we want to do. We haven't had the staff or full funding to do so, but I think we're getting close to being able to start onboarding this. High resolution mass spec really collects all of the data and the features in a sample. So say a substance is emerging. We haven't, every, every sample that we kind of report out, you know, we've got, you know, roughly 1,200 different drugs in our system or in our mass spec that we can look at. Maybe a new one's not in there, right? They add in a floral group to something or they change the hydroxy location and make a slightly different compound. Um, we would be buying a reference standard if we suspected it and analyzing it and adding it to our library. But what we can also do is do kind of a retrospective analysis on similar cases or ones that we might like in working through Mendoza because we do try to get some patient information um, from the, the medical records. We can look back at some of those similar um, 
presentations and data mine after we add that reference material into our, into our standard and see if it pops up and becomes identified. And so then you can go back a little ways and see like, did it just emerge now or have we been seeing it and didn't know about it for a month or two? But staying abreast is challenging. So, you know, for instance, I'm on multiple different calls with, and Customs and Border Patrol are usually the first ones to see stuff because they're testing at port of entries um, to try to identify what are they seeing. And there's other um, private labs that are also doing similar testing and they'll issue like quarterly threat reports or um, drug trend information. And we use all of that to see like, all right, what in Minnesota do we need to add to our panel so that we're capturing these substances if they're here? And so we're routinely trying to update that. I think we just added about 60 different compounds um, or are, are about to finalize that addition of 60 compounds to our panel. So we're routinely doing it to try to stay on top of things, but we're always kind of behind the eight ball. You know, maybe to kind of somewhat wrap this up, and I think for the people that are, I think most people are still on, I think that, you know, the, the way I got involved with you is because I had somebody who was buying something from China, and we wanted to obviously know what she was taking, and it was ended up being teneptine. But it's, but in the last couple of months, I've had two patients bring in samples of what they were using because they wanted us to destroy them. Are those things that we should be calling you for because you can it, it's interesting to see what's in a certain part of the uh the state i mean as as a group are should we be calling you and saying hey do you want to here so this patient brought in this liquid which i just had just like you those things um that what he thought was a benzodiazepine and no idea um those are ones that for sure could definitely could warrant a phone call to me um there are instances like them if you're starting to see it or it's part of like patterns you're seeing in, in patients and now you have a physical product, by all means, I think we would be happy to test those products to give you information that, of what you're seeing. You know, one of the things that comes about is we try to toe the line of not saying products are safe. And I know that's a weird thing to do uh, or to kind of have to distinguish. But the reality is that at some of the harm reduction sites, they're also trying to implement the like point of care testing for, for physical products. And it's a, like, I, I totally understand what they're trying to do, but I'm hesitant knowing some of the limitations of those point of care testing that it would certify some of these illicit substances as safe. And so in like your scenario, you've got some of these unknowns, um, they were turned into you, it's part of somewhat of a larger pattern, uh, give us a call and, and we'll discuss the best way to handle that. Could be testing, could just be like, well, you know, that might be something you just destroy. Um, but it could be sent down and we could add it into some of our mint test stuff to get a better characteriz characterization of what's uh, going on. Perfect. And then I'll say, I, I saw the brief one, you know, who pays for the testing. So our testing done in this capacity is actually covered by, there is new state funding for Mendoza um, that, is allowing us to try to expand out to other sites. So uh, tax dollars are essentially our funding part of this program. We have federal funding right now through CDC that expires at the end of the month, but there is a new five-year cycle that's about to start and we're just waiting to be awarded that funding. So a lot of this testing is actually provided to hospitals. If they're part of Mendoza, it's provided for free. Um, in essence, to you, it, it really costs time a little bit to identify people, um, patients, and we would work with the laboratory to get those clinical samples sent out to us and try to figure out the best way that they get flagged in your system so they're not destroyed before they can get transferred to our facility. In most hospitals, there's actually a courier already that goes daily between that site and the health department, um, and we can usually use that same system to get those samples here. Fabulous. Well, Jason, we really appreciate you coming on. I think that uh, hopefully we won't make your calls increase by like 6,000%. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I really appreciate the information. I think it's always good for us for us all to know what's available in some of these odd situations we get. Yeah, for sure. You know, one of my, I was our previous uh, chemical threat coordinator. So one of my tasks was to like make people aware of the services and you know, hopefully we're not needed, right? That's the whole point of preparedness. Hopefully we're not needed, but um, should you people encounter a need, please reach out and we'll 
find some way, hopefully, to support whatever you need as far as testing, whether we can do it in-house or whether we tap into the network to get you services you need. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much and for everybody that's stayed on, but thanks so much, Jason.